طيب بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله آه يا ليت لو في تأكيد إنه صوتي مسموع أي دكتور صوتك مسموع الآن جميل جدا طيب صورتي واضحة ولا لا ولا ما ولا ما المفروض ما تطلع لا لا واضح البرزنتيشن البرزنتيشن هل صورتي أنا شخص شخصية واضحة ولا لا لا لا, لا, لا. طيب جميل طيب. جدا Uh, بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم انا بس I'm scrolling through the uh, list of names I know some of you uh, I don't know the vast majority طيب uh, اخوكم هيثم الزهراني uh, cardiac surgeon at King Abdullah Medical City في مكة المكرمة طيب uh, my understanding was that this lecture was being given as a uh, exam preparation for uh, the Royal College, uh, for the Saudi board uh, uh, examinees. هل هذا صحيح ولا؟ طبعا it's, it's a series of lectures and I was told to present three lectures, one on LVADs, one on uh, uh, short-term mechanical circulatory support for cardiogenic shock and one for heart transplant. طيب, uh, I prefer to make, طبعا عشان ما تكون ثقيل عليكم, to give it in three sessions instead of one session. Manna, all three topics are uh, related to each other. طيب, uh, I would like to know, first of all, who's sitting the exam this year? Who's taking the exam? Assalamu alaikum, Doctor. I'm Mohamed Jalal from the Jeddah Hospital in Jeddah. I'm uh, sitting the exam. There's uh, also Faisal and Abdul Aziz and Hanou. محمد جلال وفيصل ايه فيصل الشمبين وعبد العزيز العتيبي والهنو we're all sitting the exam this year جميل جدا محمد جلال عسكري جدا فيصل الشمدين من من تخصص الرياض وعبد العزيز العتيبي من عسكري الرياض عسكري الرياض والهنوف اي ثينك من الجامعه من جامعة 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 الرياض طيب تشرفنا فيكم اهلا وسهلا والبقيه طبعا نتشرف فيهم جميعا طيب بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم uh, I'm sure you all came across LVAD patients at some point in your training and uh, I'm sure you have some understanding basic understanding of how LVADs work and why we put in LVADs and this is just an overview طيب just a revision for you guys and to answer any questions you may have طيب uh, Only one disclosure to make. As you all know, uh, advanced heart failure is a very bad disease with uh, very dismal prognosis. If you look at this graph, the last two lines here is medical therapy. Uh, if, you're, if you're a patient with advanced heart failure, only in medical therapy, your chance of survival at two years is only 8%. Uh, so basically people die with heart failure, advanced heart failure, if they're left on medical therapy alone. Uh, the, middle, the middle lines basically represent first generation VADs. Two year survival is 25%. Not good, but still better than medical therapy. And the top three lines is for uh, second and third generation VADs. Survival is about 70%. So it's, it's, it's why we put in VADs is number one is, is survival and number two is actually quality of life. Um, moving along. So heart transplant is eventually the best treatment option for advanced heart failure. But if you look at this graph here, the rate of heart transplant in the United States, the United States is represented by the green line, has remained constant since the 1980s, the late 80s, early 90s. In a good year, 2,500 heart transplants a year in the United States. It varies a little bit, but it remained constant over the last 30 years, if you will. The main reason for that is actually donor availability. It remains the rate limiting step in the number of heart transplants. So people had to find another way for these people to survive. Uh, if there is at any point, my voice is not clear, or if there is an interruption, please feel free to ask question or stop me. Wadah? Wait. 
first generation LVADs. Uh, طبعا, the first mechanical circulatory support was the total artificial heart by Denton Cooley and, uh, and Michael DeBakey. I'm not going to go into that. But basically, first generation LVADs, uh, the Novacore in 1984 was developed. All first generation LVADs were pulsatile flow pumps. طبعا, people thought that if we mimic the natural heart physiology, pulsatile physiology would be best. So the design was pulsatile in Novacore and HeartMate XVE in the Thoratec PVAD. All of these devices were pulsatile first generation. Um, they worked, these devices, but the problem is with a pulsatile pump, the main problem is that you have moving parts that contract 24-7, 365 days a year. And the problem with that is these moving parts fail. These moving parts fail at some point. And these are man-made devices. It's not like the human heart, millions of years of evolution. So these, these devices fail at some point. This was the HeartMate XVE uh, and the famous rematch trial, which was done on the HeartMate XVE or the HeartMate 1. Uh, basically, the device came out in 1984. As you see in the device design here, which is similar to the later designs, inflow cannula in the LV, a pump that sits in the abdominal cavity, an outflow. Uh, graft that connects the ascending aorta. The pump is connected to a power source and a controller through a drive line that exits the skin. Um, this is the first design. So the rematch trial was published in 2001 in the New England Journal of Medicine. It compared the heart mate one versus medical therapy alone. And you can see uh, the diversion of the survival curves early, favoring left ventricular assist devices. At two years, two and a half years, almost everybody died in the assist devices, basically because these, pumped, these pumps failed. High failure rate for first generation pumps. After that came the second generation pump, axial flow pumps. So this idea came to the uh, thoracic engineers when they went to India and saw this concept of axial flow uh, watering system or the Archimedes screw. Archimedes, as you may know, is a Greek philosopher and scientist who is known to be the father of fluid dynamics. So he, people, like he designed this screw or below uh, Archimedes. People found that if you bring a screw like that and you rotate it along its axis, you can actually shift liquids from one area to another. So when the engineers saw that in India, that's how farmers used to water their plants, came the idea of the HeartMate 2, uh, which uses the same principle of axial flow pumps. Okay, so this is here. Can you see the cursor of my mouse? Yes or no? Yes. Good. So inflow in the LV pump also sits extra peritoneal. It uh, pushes blood to the outflow tract. This is a pump. It used to sit on a ruby stone bearing. This is a ruby stone bearing, very fancy. Okay. Um, axial flow pump, continual. This was basically the first continuous flow LVAD. And this was a game changer in the LVAD uh, technology. Um, These are the survival curves. Heart made two versus medical therapy. Impressive. And it's very hard to see a treatment effect of this magnitude in any therapy. If you look at the survival here. 70% at two years versus 8%. Number needed to treat is 1.8. What does that mean is that you need to put in two LVADs in two years to save one life. This is almost unreal. The number needed to treat for CRT devices is 10. So you need to put in 10 CRT devices to save one life. So that's why it's, it's really incredibly effective. Okay. 
axial flow pumps came with their problems, which we will uh, explore later. One of them was pump thrombosis and stroke rate. Basically, after that came the third generation LVADs, um, centrifugal pumps. Centrifugal pumps are different from axial flow pumps in a few things. Basically, the inflow and the outflow are not in the same axis. There's a 90 degree axis. Inflow comes in from this direction, outflow comes out from this direction. Two centrifugal pumps in the market. Now it's only one, the HVAD heart, uh, hardware um, was removed from the market due to increased risk of stroke. Now the only centrifugal long-term LVAD approved in the market is the HeartMate 3. HeartMate 3 also was a revolution because it's magnetically levitated, magnetic levitation technology. What that means is uh, basically, I, the analogy of that is the trains in Japan, I'm not sure if anybody went to Japan or saw the trains in Japan. The trains in Japan travel at a speed of 400 miles an hour, 300 miles an hour. And that is because the trains are fully magnetically levitated. There is no contact between the train wheels and the rails. The train travels, it's levitated, okay? No friction, high speed, uh, highly efficient, highly efficient pumps. And full magnetic levitation means that it's more efficient pumping. There's no friction. It is more durable. There is no uh, pump failure or very much, much less pump failure rates. There are no mechanical or fluid bearings. There's less hemolysis. There's also wide gaps between the motor and the pump and the pump housing. Very wide gaps. Um, you can stack 167 red blood cells between the motor and the pump housing. This completely eliminated pump thrombosis. It's virtually eliminated. There is no such thing as pump thrombosis in the heart mate 3. It used to be a problem with the heart mate 2. Yes, you can still have strokes. You can still have clots travel in the gaps and go outside but you cannot have thrombosis within the pump. So this was the momentum trial. The momentum trial um, was, I think, published in 2018 or 17, I'm not quite sure. So basically, um, patients were randomized to receive either a heart mate three or a heart mate two on a one-to-one -one basis. 294 patients, uh, then they were followed up. And the outcome that was measured was Event-free survival. Event-free survival was defined as survival without stroke, survival without pump exchange. So not only survival, but survival with a good outcome. These were the curves for primary uh, outcome. With the heart mate three, 75% survived with a good outcome. With the heart mate two, only 60% survived with a good outcome. Overall survival between the two groups were similar. And RV failure rate between the two groups were similar as well. But certainly here, heart mate three wins. And it wins because here, suspected pump thrombosis, definitely favoring heart mate three. No pump thrombosis in heart mate three. Stroke rate was significantly less with the heart mate three. Ischemic or hemorrhagic. Disabling stroke was less. Bleeding, requiring surgery, bleeding not requiring surgery, GI bleed not requiring. All of these were significantly favoring the heart mate three. In terms of uh, driveline infections, in terms of RV failure, two pumps uh, performed similarly. Okay, oh, this is, what is this slide? Okay, this slide, impact of bridge transplant with continuous flow. But man, there was a concern when you put in an LVAD and you list the patient for transplant, there is a concern that this patient, the transplant procedure actually becomes more complicated due to the adhesions and due to this and that. So there were concerns that actually patients bridge bridged with LVAD therapy may have a, a worse outcomes, uh, outcome after transplant. But this study actually proved that in patients supported with LVADs versus patients not supported with a VAD, the transplant outcome was similar. So putting in an LVAD in a patient for bridging does not alter their uh, final transplant outcome. Uh, there was a slide about how the device works. I think it was deleted by mistakes. Anyway, I'm just going to touch briefly on how this device works, magnetic levitation, okay? 
So any centrifugal pump is comprised of two main components, something called the rotor, or just a door and the stator, or just a thabit. طيب الجزء الثابت اللي هو الستيتر has copper coils طيب copper coils negatively and positively charged copper coils when you uh, turn on electricity when you turn on an electrical current across these copper coils a magnetic field is generated and the strength of this magnetic field is uh, directly proportional to the strength of the electrical current that's why we can turn on and turn off the speed so once an electrical, once a magnetic field is generated, the rotor here in the middle spins, and the the, the speed uh, at which the rotor spins can be controlled by actually altering the current. This is the same technology that's used in your in your home blender, خلاط العصير أو خلاط الأكل. The same technology: copper coils, uh, a rotor, and a stator. All technology, but now used in LVMs. Um, indications, I'm sure you're familiar with this. Bridge to tra transplant versus bridge to candidacy or destination therapy. Nowadays, really, the distinction is less clear between bridge to transplant or bridge to destination therapy. A lot of patients are destination therapy, but then they become transplant candidates and mainly what prevents them from being transplant candidates in the first place is high PVRs. A high PVR is the only hemodynamic contraindication to heart transplant, okay? A lot of these patients with chronic heart failure will have uh, high PVRs that precludes a heart transplant. Once you put in an LVAD, the PVR drops and they become transplant candidates again. So we put in LVADs in patients with refractory heart failure symptoms with reduced ejection fraction despite being a maximum medical therapy. A VO2 max is a guide. Your VO2 max, your maximum oxygen extraction, less than 14 cc per kg per minute is only a guide. It's not an absolute thing to have. A patient who needs a transplant is a patient who needs a transplant. You don't need a VO2 max on every patient. Um, bridge to candidacy. So sometimes, yes, patients with multi-organ dysfunction, patients with... Uh, um, renal failure, kidney failure, and things like that uh, are destination therapy patients. Uh, obesity is also a contraindication to transplant because of difficulty for finding a size match, um, advanced age, systemic illness. All these patients go for uh, destination therapy. Things uh, that precludes or prevent uh, contraindications to LVAD therapy, these are all the relative contraindications, okay? These are all, you can all like, these are relative things. Not every patient who fulfills these criteria um, is deprived from, from having a VAT. So inability to take oral anticoagulation, recurrent bleeding, brain bleeds, things like that. Uh, severe comorbid conditions with limited life expectancy, cancers, uh, lymphomas, things like that. Inadequate psychosocial support, patients let's say homeless patients and patients who can't afford medications. If you put an VAD on these patients, they don't do well, they die. Uh, patients uh, with substance abuse, same issue. If you put an VAD on them, they don't do very well. Severe RV dysfunction with high likelihood of needing an RV support post-op. This is a relative contraindication. Um, RV failure post LVAD is common. Not every RV limitation is a contraindication for LVAD. But if you're certain that this patient will uh, need an RVAD post-op, they are not gonna do well with an LVAD. They're gonna require an RVAD post-op uh, temporary, and then you're gonna wait and wait and wait. They're not gonna come, they're not gonna be weaned off from the RVAD. And it's better off to put them in a bivad support or a total artificial heart uh, from the get-go, from the start. Uh, we're going to delve more into RV dysfunction post-op in, in another slide. But other comorbidities, yes, certain cardiomyopathies. Certain cardiomyopathies are not good for LVAD therapies. Uh, anybody knows any cardiomyopathy that's not suitable for LVAD? Any idea? Any cardiomyopathy that's not good? Or patients don't do well with a certain cardiomyopathy? 
طيب uh, uh, one of them hypertrophic uh, cardiomyopathy hyper exactly so, one of them hypertrophic yes one of them the reason um, is you know the reason Muhammad uh, because they have a small LV cavity so they yeah. can easily suck down uh, exactly Muhammad that's, 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 that's the point that's the point so basically for an LVAT to work properly you need a big LV you need a big LV you need a big LA for LVAT to work properly okay as we will see in a different slide um, these uh, patients with Hocum have very small LV cavities and they, they're, they're in continuous suctioning events, a perpetual state of suctioning events. So they don't do well. Another group of patients is patients with uh, heart, severe heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. They, they typically don't do well because the problem is not LV contractility. The problem is LV filling and you need LV filling for LVAT to work. Another type of cardiomyopathy also is restrictive cardiomyopathy for the same reasons, basically, because they have restricted filling. And if you don't fill your LV, your LVAD will not work. Okay. Is, is, is that clear until now? Okay. There are certain considerations when you're, when you're taking a patient for VADs, okay? A patient with aortic regurgitation, if you have anything more than moderate AI, that should be fixed intraoperatively. Do we know why? Why should we fix sure. AI? You'll have... Um essentially circular flow, the flow will go back. Exactly, the circle, yes, around. you will recircle, exactly. Basically anything that you, the pump will pump into the aorta will go back into the LV. And uh, the pump will not work. Patients will remain in heart failure. So you can either do an AVR or something called a park stitch. You can read about the park stitch later. Basically you just plicate the leaflets together to prevent AI. Uh, AVR, the choice of the valve, if you're putting an LVAD, what valve would you choose? Mechanical or tissue valve? Any answers? Okay. The yeah, answer is tissue valve. Yeah. Exactly, tissue valve. And the reason is uh, there's a high rate of thrombotic events with mechanical valves. Because you know that in, in, in that patients, a significant proportion of them will not have aortic valve opening because of basically no native cardiac function. There will be no contraction. There will be no aortic valve opening. The valve will remain closed during the whole cardiac cycle. This will cause the valve to thrombose. So we prefer tissue valves. Despite the patient being on anticoagulation, we put in a tissue valve. Wait. Mitral regurgitation, what should you do with mitral regurgitation in a patient undergoing an LVAD? Should you fix it? Should you change the valve? Should you repair the valve? Any answers? Okay, <laughs> no answers. Uh, mitral valve regurgitation, you should leave it alone because gen, it's, it's functional. It's an LV problem. It's not a mitral, mitral, it's not a structural problem with the valve. So you leave MR alone, the VAD will fix the mitral regurgitation. Tricuspid regurgitation used to be a controversial topic, okay? People used to fix any TR in a patient undergoing VAD. And the idea behind that was that they will have less symptoms of RV uh, failure post-op, like less fluid edema, less this and that. But there are two recent case series. I think one of them was from Yale and one of them was from Chicago that showed uh, an increased rate of um, adverse outcomes if you fix the TR than if you leave it alone. And that physiologically, that makes sense because the tricuspid valve in these patients works as a pop-off valve. The tricuspid valve, the RV basically unloads itself through the tricuspid valve. It's the only way for the RV to unload is to have TR. So these patients survive because of TR. And if we remove the survival mechanism for these patients by fixing the TR, they don't do well. Um, assessment of RV function, there's so many things uh, to assess the RV functions. Honestly, 
I the one I care about the most is, is mean RA pressure. Mean RA pressure or CVP is a really good indicator. Right ventricular stroke work index by echo, TAPSI, PAPI. PAPI is excellent as well. It's it's the strongest predictor of RV failure. Pa PAPI, the problem with PAPI is that it's it's an um, a cath lab derived measure. You need a heart, right heart cath to derive it. And uh, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with PAPI. It's a pulmonary artery pressure index. It's a systolic PA minus diastolic PA divided by mean RA pressure. Any value less than one is the strongest predictor of RV failure, not only post VAT, but post any cardiac surgery or in acute cardiogenic shock. Um, I think we uh, we went through this a little bit, how VAD works. You can see here the, um, the size of the pump housing. It's big, it's a big pump, and which, which has implications in the operative implantation. Putting in an, a hardware RVAD is much easier than putting a HeartMate 3 due to the size. Uh, the size limitation intraoperatively is a bonus postoperatively because these pumps perform much better clinically, heart may freeze. Okay, the rotor, the stator, the pump housing, flow, inflow, outflow. Type, surgical technique. I mean, maybe you're familiar with it. It can be done through a full sternotomy or it can be done through a left anterior thoracotomy and uh, an upper mini sternotomy. Uh, we'll talk about the differences between these uh, two techniques, but basically uh, you go on cardiopulmonary bypass, hypernize the patient. After that, you uh, basically expose the apex of the heart. You determine your um, insertion point by echo guidance. Usually you want to be, usually, not usually, always, you want to be facing, you want your inflow, to be facing the mitral valve orifice. And you confirm that by echocardiogram. Uh, basically, you sew in the ring. After sewing in the ring, you make the coring or you make a hole by the coring device. Uh, some people make the coring before the ring. Some people make it after putting the ring. Um, I prefer to do it, to do the coring at the beginning core, then put in your ring, you, there's much better um, visibility. There's much better accuracy of placing the sutures. Um, here in the slide, you see the surgeon is actually cutting the trabeculations. These trabeculations sometimes can impact your uh, inflow cannula. So make sure you trim all trabeculations in the endocardium. Uh, put in your pump. Make sure that the outflow graft is inferior, facing south. You want the outflow graft to lie in the diaphragmatic surface to avoid injury during reentry. This is called the bend relief of the outflow graft. It's also protective against kinking. Um, you put it in, you exteriorize your drive line. The surgery itself is, is really straightforward and simple. It's the management post-op. Then the outflow graft, as we said, uh, you bring it in the diaphragmatic surface all the way along the uh, right atrium, and then you anastomose it to the ascending aorta using a side biting clamp into side anastomosis, straightforward. Then you wean the patient from cardiopulmonary bypass. There are steps. Uh, I didn't put any slides for, for weaning from cardiopulmonary bypass, but basically you want a clamp on your outflow graft. You turn on the pump on full bypass. You turn on your LVAD pump to de-air. You put in a de-airing uh, method, either like a, like, a, like a vent or a de-airing needle. You turn on the VAD at low speed to de-air it completely. You remove your clamp and you uh, go up on your speed slowly uh, while going down on your cardiopulmonary bypass flows. 
always monitoring the RV, monitoring the blood pressure. And you come off bypass and you adjust your pump speed initially in the port first port according to echo filling. You have an echo in the operating room. You adjust your speed according to how much LV filling you have. Usually in the first days post-op, you uh, avoid excessive speeds to avoid um, uh, suction events. Usually in the first post-operative days, you have RV limitations, you have uh, third spacing. You, you don't need, you, your LV filling is impaired and you don't need high speeds. This is the echo image intra-op. This is a uh, four chamber mid-esophageal. That's where you see your inflow cannula. This is a good position. It's facing the mitral valve. There is some forgiveness to this. You don't have to be 100% coaxial to the mitral valve. You can see here, it's a little bit tilted, but it's fine. As long as it's not facing the lateral wall or the septum or something like that, um, it's good. And then this is a long axis mid-esophageal. This is the outflow graft. You see it here. Uh, thoracotomy versus stenotomy approach. Proponents of the thoracotomy approach believe it's better for the right ventricle. They reported lower rates of RV dysfunction with thoracotomy approach versus full sternotomy approach. And they believe this is because you actually spare part of the pericardium. You leave it intact. And this protect against RV ballooning. To me, uh, honest, I, I don't, I think it's just selection bias because patients who undergo a thoracotomy approach are usually patients with highly selected, good protoplasm patients with good RVs. That's why you have a lower rate of RV dysfunction. It's selection bias rather than anything else. There was also a trend uh, towards lower mortality with thoracotomy in the paper by Drolinsky and colleagues. Um, tra uh, trends to lower mortality with thoracotomy not reaching statistical significance. Again, it's, I think it's all related to selection bias. These are non-randomized series. So the main advantage of a thoracotomy approach to me is re-entry. You sort of have a virgin chest when you go for a transplant. Not fully, but adhesions are a bit more, uh, the less severe with, with the thoracotomy approach. That's the main advantage of, to me to a thoracotomy. Wait, heart mate three, this is the interface of the, of the pump controller. Uh, a few things here, pump flow, pump speed, pulse index, pump power. This is the main clinical settings, how you turn on the speed, you turn on the lower speed limit, you enter your hematocrits, alarms, you set up the alarms. This is save that history. This is how you check on the log of the machine. So let's focus just on the main clinical interface. Uh, how just to basic reading. The only thing an operator can control is the pump speed. That's the only thing you can dial. Tayyip? Pump flow. Pump flow, um, what's important for you to know is that pump flow is not calculated by the, it's not measured by, by the machine. There is no flow sensors in the LVAD machines. The flow of the pump is calculated using the brain of the machine based on a constant relationship between two or three things. There is a constant relationship between the pump power and the pump speed and hematocrit of the patient, which is blood viscosity. Basically, hematocrit is, is, is blood viscosity. So if I set up the speed at 5,500, the pump calculates how much power it needs to drive at this speed, 4.5 watts. And then from this calculation, it gives you the flow of the pump. It's very important to know that the pump flow is not measured, it's only a calculation. And flow is directly uh, related to speed and directly related to power. The more speed there is, the more flow you will get. And flow is inversely related to delta P. And delta P is an important concept if you're managing a bad patient. Delta P is the difference between aortic pressure and LV pressure. And the higher aortic pressure, the less the LVAD flow will be and vice versa. The lower aortic pressure, the higher the flow. 
pressure gradients, basically. Okay, and this is an important concept to understand the delta P. Usually, pump speed ranges between 4,800 to 6,000, usually in the first post operative days, 4,500, 4,800. And then, what I, what I learned to do from my mentors in the first post operative days is uh, that the settings, the lower speed settings, um, the pump has a lower speed setting. If there is a suction event, which we will explain later, the pump will drop its speed as a protective uh, measure to uh, prevent suctioning. The lower speed that the pump can go to is something that you set as an operator. Usually in the first post-operative day, it's 500 or 600 below the speed limit that I put. Wait, pump power we spoke about, basically, it's the power the pump requires to drive at a, at a certain speed. It ranges between 4.5 to 6.5. That's the range. Higher pump power can indicate problems. Low pump power can indicate problems. Pulse index. That's also another important clinical parameter or pump parameter that uh, you sort of need to understand when you're managing ill that patient. It's basically in the most simplest terms, a pulse index is the variation in pump power with each ventricular contraction, and it's averaged over 15 seconds. The value you see live is an average value for the last 15 seconds. The screen refreshes if every 15 seconds. So, yep. Um, it's basically why it's important. It's actually a reflection of the loading condition of the ventricle, okay? A low PI, high PI can mean different things in the setting of a low flow alarm or a symptomatic patient. So basically in the troubleshooting of the ELVAD, you look at this quite well. Some patients will have, there, there's something called uh, the PI event. Basically a PI event is any abrupt change in the pump power over 45% of power the pump will trigger a reduction in the pump speed. And that goes to the lowest speed setting that you sit at the pump. And this is a protective mechanism against suctioning. Uh, it's something you can uh, find out through the log or the history here, if you have a patient. You do that in each time you assess a VAT patient in clinic or as an inpatient. The PI range is 3.5 to 5.5. A high PI can mean something, a low PI can mean something, and we will explain that briefly. This slide, what is this slide? RV failure post LVAD. So RV failure post LVAD is, is, a, is not a good problem, but it's common. It happens about 10% of the time, but it comes in many flavors. Some of it can be treated pharmacologically, some of it can be treated with certain measures, some of it needs an RVAD, okay? Um, once you have um, uh, RV failure post LVAD, your outcomes actually, the likelihood of having a bad outcome increases. Um, there are two reasons, two main reasons why um, RV fails post an LVAD. Usually these patients, all of them have borderline RV function, but, the, but it can support your, your circulation, but usually it's exacerbated. This borderline RV is exacerbated and it fails totally post LVAD insertion. The first reason is here. Once you decompress the LV, once you decompress the LV, you cause the, sh the septum to shift to the left. Uh, there is a phenomenon called ventr ventricular interdependence. Uh, I'm sure you heard about it. Ventricular interdependence basically means that the loading condition of one ventricle affects the loading condition of the other ventricle. Okay, ventricular interdependence. That's why when you have a failing RV in a good LV post-op, let's say your RV fails, your RV balloons, you get a septal shift to the lift, to the left. Uh, basically, your LV fails. That's because of ventricular interdependence. Both ventricles work together. That's ventricular interdependence. So when you put an LVAD, you decompress the LV. The, se the septum shifts and that causes problems. The other reason is that the right side is seeing more flow. There is more blood going back to the right side because of higher cardiac output. You put in a VAD, you have high cardiac output. All of a sudden, your RA is receiving more blood that it cannot handle. So your RV is um, overloaded, your RV fails. This is an exam question that's common. Uh, uh, I'm not putting exam question this year, but, but these two points are really important. Once you have 
RV failure post LVAT, your survival actually becomes worse, as you can see here from, from this uh, survival curve. This was in HeartMate 2. Same applies to HeartMate 3. <clears throat> like, how do you manage RV failure post LVAT? Basically, you start the management pre-op. You basically anticipate it, okay? Uh, as we said, mean RA pressures, TAPSI, um, PAPI, and all these things. But in the operating room, really, you want you want a higher map. You want some you want some S SVR basically. Okay, higher map with pressures. You avoid excessive LVAD speeds. You put in lower speeds. You use inotropes, things like mildrenone and epinephrine. Uh, you avoid bradycardia. You keep the heart rate above 90, pace the patient if required, and do not beta block them. If they're, if they're running at 120, 130, sign a stack, do not beta block them because their cardiac output is rate dependent. Uh, avoid pulmonary vasoconstriction. Avoid uh, hypoxia and hypercarbia are very bad uh, vasoconstrictors. They can increase your RV afterload. So avoid that. Talk to your anesthetist. Inhaled nitrous, nitric oxide. Um, some centers routinely come off pump on 40 parts per million of NO. We don't do that, but uh, some centers do that. And then finally, if all fails, you put in RVAD. RVADs, uh, we're going to talk about RVADs in the next session in the short term mechanical support and how we put in RVADs. Come on. Um, what is this like? Complications post LVAD. Taiwan, the current unknown LVAD, LVADs have excellent results. They, they make patients live longer and happier, but it's not without problems. Okay, these are the complications. There's so many problems associated with LVAD therapy, and these are the main things. Gastrointestinal bleeding is the most common complication post LVAD therapy. Um, approximately 60% uh, will have uh, gastrointestinal bleeding at some point. Cardiac reasons, heart failure. They do come back with heart failure. But the most common thing for heart failure admission post LVAD is um, inadequate pump settings, excessive speed or high speed. You need to optimize your pump. Things like arrhythmias, things like uh, RV dysfunction also are these common reasons for readmissions, infections, uh, drive line infections, um, and pump in, pump pocket infections. We don't see that a lot, pump pocket infections with heart mate 3 because it's intrapericardial. Unlike the heart mate 2, it's extrapericardial in the peritoneal cavity. Used to be a lot of pump pocket infections, and it used to be a, <clears throat> a reason for urgent transplantation in these patients. I have seen pump pocket infections with uh, um, heart matrices, though, and with, with uh, heart wares. So it does still does happen. Thrombosis. Pump thrombosis uh, with heart mate 2 and with heart wear is a problem. Is no longer a problem with uh, heart mate 3. But thrombotic events, showering, can still happen with heart mate 3. Can have a big clot travel within the big spacing in the pump housing. Uh, you can still have strokes, you can still have uh, uh, bowel ischemia and things like that, okay? Brain bleed, very bad, extremely bad, or trauma or head injury that causes brain bleeds, very bad, okay? Pump events, abnormal readouts, abnormal alarms is a very common reason, low flow alarms, uh, things like that. Okay, uh, assisting these patients, uh, if you have a patient in eMERGE or a patient in the clinic, an L LVAD patient, you basically need... Um, a full history and exam. And your history should be focused on a few things, heart failure symptoms. How are they feeling? Level of activity, fatigue. Unfortunately, a common thing that I see is that when a patient comes back with fatigue, shortness of breath, people say, oh, he's a heart failure patient, it's okay. It's expect no, it's, it's not expected to see an LVAD patient who is fatigued with short of breath. They should be in class one or two, class NYHA class one or two. Anything, uh, anything more than that, there is something abnormal that needs to be addressed. So you ask them about level of activity, fatigue, shortness of breath, orthopnea, things like that, appetite, GI symptoms, uh, nausea, vomiting, melina, uh, melina uh, pure bleeding, um, headache, neurological symptoms. Ask about their mood and how they're sleeping because these things are important. A lot of them actually develop depression 
it's an adjustment phase for them, a new thing. So a lot of them, uh, some centers routinely prescribe anti um, uh, mood therapy, what do you call it? Depressants, antidepressants. Uh, and it's not a bad idea to be honest with you. <clears throat> Exam, physical exam, a few things to focus on the physical exam in an LVAT patients. The weight, the weight of the patient. Every patient should have a documented dry weight and they should weigh themselves daily at home. Change, abrupt changes in weight means excess water, means excess, means heart failure basically. Uh, blood pressure, you have to measure the blood pressure. Um, the vast majority of them will not have a blood pressure by a non-invasive BP reading machine because they don't have pulsatile flow. So the, the way to do it is to get their map via Doppler. A lot of, maybe a lot of you are familiar with that. You basically use a cuff, you bring in your Doppler machine to the brachial artery, you listen to the hum or the noise generated by the VAD. There is no pulsatility like you use a Doppler in vascular surgery. It doesn't happen. You just hear constant hum. You listen to it, you inflate your cuff until it disappears. You deflate your cuff once it returns, that's your map, it's not your systolic, okay? And we'll talk about map and map targets in a later slide. You doc document their map, you look at their CVP, do they have a high GVP or not? You look at their liver span, you auscultate their lungs, do they have what lungs, do they have edema? You look at their driveline site and you look at the LVAD log, you look, in for, you look at alarms and PI events in the LVAD alarm. So basically a thorough exam, any patient, any time a patient comes to emerge or to clinic. Okay, <clears throat> I have some scenarios here. Uh, uh, I'm not gonna pick names. If you want to answer, you're welcome to come and answer. So first scenario here, uh, we have a 42 year old man with a heart matri uh, LVAD inserted three years ago for non-ischemic dilated cardiomyopathy. He presents with recurrent low flow alarms associated with dizziness. And the review of system, the patient has no shortness of breath, no cough, no orthopnea PND, no GI or GU symptoms, just low flow alarms and dizzy, but no heart failure symptoms. On exam, he has a map of 96. His JVP is normal. There no, there's no edema, there's no RV failure signs or symptoms. Pump flow is 3.1, that's low. PI of 7.5, that's a high PI. Pump speed is at 5,200. What would you like to do? Would you like to get a CT chest? Would you like to get an echo? Would you like to increase the pump speed? Would you like to start Ramipril? Would you like to do CND? Any volunteers? I'm worried that nobody's nobody's hearing my voice. Samin al. Yes, sir. Here, doctor. Okay, good. Right. Basically, this patient has low flow. To summarize, low flow and a high MAP of 96 and a high PI of 7.5 in the absence of a high JVP, in the absence of RV failure symptoms. The so, we stopped, uh, hmm? so uh, <clears throat> if you may, may answer, uh, stop anti hypertensive. Good, stop anti hypertensive, but it's going to take a few hours to work. So, you're going to increase the pump speed because the pump has to work against a higher afterload. So you do both. You start Ramipril is the right answer, to be honest, but it takes a few hours for it to work. Patient is having low flow and is symptomatic. You just ramp up the pump. Pump, increase the speed, you start Ramipril, okay? Uh, one second. Uh, just one second, excuse me guys. Um, I just have to take a quick. Play. Uh, okay. Uh, you know, hypertension. So as we said, flow is inversely proportional to the pressure difference between the aorta and the LV. Centrifugal pumps are afterload sensitive. Uh, so with hypertension, you get low flows, you get PIs. Okay. Hypertension in a normal patient, 
let's say a patient without LVAD, okay, who's hypertensive, does not have low flow or low cardiac output, okay? So usually hypertension does not give you low cardiac output, say in a, in a regular patient. In an LVAD patient, it can. That's something you need to know, that hypertension can give you low cardiac output in LVAD. And that's because the patient has a centrifugal pump and centrifugal pumps are sensitive to afterload. Your target map should be between 65 and 80, okay? There's another reason you should control the blood pressure is that there is an increased risk of stroke with, with hypertension. Like this, this study here, this graph here is a forest plot. Uh, basically, these are the risk factors for stroke formation. And the strongest one was a map above 90. If your map is uncontrolled, you have a high risk of stroke. So that's, that's why you need to control blood pressure. These are the recommendations for blood pressure management, basically in patients with VADs. Um, if they have a systolic blood pressure, it should be, if they have pulsatility, it should be less than 130. If they have uh, a MAP, it should be less than 80. 85 should be a good number. Evidence is 2B for sure, because there are no randomized control trials. All of these are based on single center experiences and expert opinions. Um, Another slide here is for a recommendation for heart failure therapy. Standard heart failure therapy applies to LVAD patients. If they were on ACE inhibitors, they should continue on ACE inhibitors, okay? Um, mineral corticoid receptors, beta blockers, and things like that. Um, with regards to Entresto and SGLT inhibitors, um, I have not seen any recommendation or guidelines. These are, these are new therapies and I, I don't, I don't know if they have any uh, recommendation about the use of these novel therapies in LVAD patients. Okay, next case, um, scenario two. A 55-year-old male patient with a heart rate 32 years ago for... for ischemic cardiomyopathy. The patient comes with worsening heart failure symptoms. Kawani. Hello? I'm, I'm giving the lecture. Hey. Oh, sorry. It's an emergency? Critical anatomy? Patient, patient is the resting or no? Okay, okay, class. And I'm giving a lecture and I'm coming. Okay, thanks. ASIF type, um, <clears throat> patient comes in with heart failure symptoms two years after NOVAD. Patient has orthopnea PND at night, reduced exercise tolerance, patient is in heart failure. His exam shows an increased weight of plus five kilograms. His MAP is 77, is fine. He has fine crackles on, on auscultation. His flow is 8.2 liters per minute, it's high flow. His PI is 1.8, that's low PI. What do you think is going on? And what would you like to do? High flow, low PI, heart failure, severe heart failure, and a patient with high flows, LVAD. Any idea? Maybe an RV failure. Okay, RV failure usually presents with a high, oh, RV failure presents with high JVP on exam, you, you have low flows and you have low, low PIs. Yes, low PIs, but low flows. And you have an increased weight, that's it. But the key here is a flow. RV failure does not give you a high flow, it gives you low flow. Right. Uh, well, the answer is, I would like to get a TTE, basically. What I think this patient has, basically, is aortic regurgitation. That's the problem. Uh, it gives you high flows and low PIs and heart failure symptoms if you have aortic regurgitation with LVADs, okay? Uh, aortic insufficiency basically increased flow due to recirculation of the blood. Blood is pumped by the pump into the aorta and it goes back to the LV in a circle. You have decreased PI. It's actually a progressive problem with LVAD. Just by virtue of having an LVAD, because of the... Um, constant flow nature of the LVAD, you will have progression of aortic insufficiency over time. 
uh, 8% annual, you will develop new or worsening AI. The treatment for that is surgical. It's a mechanical problem that you have to fix it. No medication will fix your AI. And AI is a, is a limiting legion in almost every type of mechanical support, whether it be short-term or long-term. That's something you need to know. <clears throat> Third scenario here, a 49-year-old female, HeartMate 3, presents with fatigue and syncope. She has a history of dark stools for three days. On exam, she has a low GVP, JVP. She has a MAP of 60. She has an unremarkable cardiac exam. Her flows are normal, 4.8. PI normal, 3.5. Speed is normal. But when you look at the device log, you see multiple low flow alarms and PI events. Lots of PI events. Usually, she has five PI events per day, and she has now... 25 PI events. What would you like to do? You want to decrease the pump speed? You want to do a CBC and a cross match? You want to do A and B? You want to increase the pump speed? You want to do a T, TT? B. Good. No, both A and B. Both A and B, exactly. Both A and B. You want to reduce the suctioning events and the low flows. You want to slightly drop the pump speed and you want to resuscitate this patient. First of all, with fluids, and then get a CBC and a cross match, transfuse her if uh, uh, she needs to, and find out where she's bleeding from. She needs admission, basically. Okay. Play. Uh, GI bleed is the most common cause of free admission. It occurs in 30% of LVAT patients, predisposing factors, three reasons why LVAT patients bleed. Okay. Remember that there's a high INR, basically, they're on warfarin. They develop acquired Van Willebrand disease. And that's because of the non pulsatile nature. And they also develop AV malformation in the GI tract due to also to the non pulsatile It's related to the non pulsatile flow, non-physiologic, non pulsatile flow. Basically, prevention. Stop aspirin, high patient. Basically, the, the guidelines now recommend using aspirin and warfarin. Again, this is not written with hard stone. This is a 2B level of evidence C. Uh, there is an ongoing randomized control trial comparing aspirin uh, with warfarin or warfarin alone. So you just to stop the aspirin in these patients with the GI bleeding. Everybody should be on a PPI, proton pump inhibitor. In recurrent bleeding, octreotide injections uh, has been shown to be effective in reducing the rate of recurrent bleed. Omega-3 also is... Um, has been shown to uh, be effective in reducing the GI. I don't know the mechanism, to be honest, but there is a randomized control trial ongoing also to assess the efficacy of uh, omega-3. Low flow uh, algorithm. If you have a patient with a low flow, this, this graph is only for you guys to just have a basic understanding. Uh, there is nothing better than experience. I find that graphs and, and algorithms Usually, they uh, make us into machines, and we, we don't function like machines. This is for machine learning and machines, but we're not. We're humans. But it's just to give you an idea of what to do when you have a low-flow alarm patient, a patient with low-flow alarm. Basically, if you have a low-flow uh, alarm, uh, sorry, a hypotensive patient, we're not talking about low-flow. If you have a hypotensive LVAD patient uh, presenting to emerge, what you do with them? Basically, determine if the flow is, flow, uh, is, the flow is low or the flow is high or normal. If the, there is low flow, um, consider a few things, basically. If the JVP is high, you're worried about RV problem, you do an echo. And the RV is bad, there's RV dysfunction, you treat RV dysfunction accordingly. Anotropes, diuresis, whatever. Uh, no RV dysfunction, an echo, with a, uh, but, there, but the peak, the pulmonary capillary ridge pressure is high. And there is no RV dysfunction. The patient is inadequately unloaded. So you adjust your pump speed, you increase your pump speed. Sometimes tamp also tamponade, PE, pneumothorax can give you these, uh, this pattern of high JVP and low flow. So you fix accordingly. Now, low flow with low JVP, your patient is hypovolemic. Low hematocrit, your patient is bleeding, find out why, cross match them, reverse them, if need be, give them blood. Or they have an adequate hematocrit. Let's say they're hypovolemic because of nausea, vomiting, or diarrhea. 
re replace their fluid. If a patient is hypotensive with high LVAD flows or, or normal flows, uh, basically high LVAD flows, uh, consider uh, a vasodilatation as a cause. If they have fever, consider sepsis, septic shock. If there's no fever, consider their uh, vasodilatation, um, medication, hold their ACE inhibitors, hold their um, sildenafil, whatever, okay? This is just an algorithm to uh, for you guys to understand how you approach such patients. I think this is the last slide in my presentation. There's so much that can be said in an LVAD lecture. I just selected the important things that you guys probably need to know for your exam. Uh, but if you have any questions, uh, please do. Okay. Thank you for your lecture. Thank you, Dr. Haitha. If I may ask. Um, you mentioned earlier how in, if we have some other pathological valvular disease, we do not interfere, like in mitral regurgitation. And I can't get my head around it. Like the LVAD will pose a risk of thromboembolic events. So why leave structural abnormality that can increase the risk of thromboembolism and not fix it? Okay, uh, we, we talked about two things. Um, if you have severe mitral regurgitation, you leave it alone. If you leave severe mitral regurgitation alone, it will be fixed by the LVAD. And leaving it alone will not increase your thromboembolic risk. But if you have AI and you leave the patient with AI and don't fix it, you will have problems. You will have a patient with AI and an LVAD therapy. You will not fix their heart failure problem they will recirculate back into the ventricle. So you have to, yes, an aortic valve replacement is an evil and as it's a necessary evil, uh, if you will. Um, fix your aortic valve with a park stitch. You basically, you, it's application. Uh, when you do a park stitch also, you limit your aortic valve opening. And when you have a patient with LVAD, you like you actually favorably want to maintain some, aortic valve opening at all times. If the, uh, the, the park stitch limits that, so your option would be an AVR. And the lesser evil is a tissue valve. It's less likely to thrombose. Okay, um, did I answer your question correctly? Yes, thank you. Bye, Tamam. Any other questions? Dictor, if you have a patient with a, a mitral stenosis uh, and an aortic pathology, uh, uh, would you uh, uh, take him for an uh, LVAD? Uh, usually, mitral stenosis patients have normal LV function, unless there's another reason, okay? Uh, so I did not encounter this scenario. Um, but if you, let's say you have a big ventricle LV failure, usually they have small LVs, but if, let's say a patient has an, an LV, a big LV or heart failure and a mitral stenosis, what's going to happen if you put an LVAD, you're not going to have LV filling. Your problem will persist. So what you're going to do is you have to fix the mitral stenosis. You have many, you have some options. You can do a, valv a valvotomy, like a, a commissure commissurotomy to relieve the mitral stenosis, surgical commissurotomy, intra-op, probably that options. Some patients have, I've seen patients with valvectomy, mitral valvectomy. These patients, I've seen a patient, a congenital patient with AV malformation. She has a, a common chamber in the left side. She has no mitral valve, uh, but she had very excessive high pump speed to, to actually keep up with the, with the LV, with the amount of, of volume in the LV. So, Yes, you, you cannot live with mitral stenosis because mitral stenosis impairs your LV filling. But generally, mitral stenosis patients do not need a VAT. They may have RV failure, but they, that's not going to be fixed by an LVAT. But if you come into a scenario where actually you have both LV failure and mitral stenosis, you have to relieve the mitral stenosis. <clears throat> okay, thank you. And would it be a problem having two uh, prosthetic valves if we are replacing both valves? No, uh, exactly. So same same problem. If you have a, a prosthesis in the LV, 
yes, you will lose volatility. You will have a higher risk of thrombosis. طيب. If you actually uh, want to decrease it, you, you use it, a, a tissue valve rather than a mechanical valve. Again, same concept. Uh, I have seen patients uh, with, yeah, uh, biprosthetic mitral valves having LVADs, yes. But again, it, uh, it, it, it still increases your risk of thromboembolic events and um, a tissue is better than, than, than a mechanical. Okay, sorry, just the last question. Uh, regarding the uh, heart mate and the use in the uh, congenital population in failed Fontan adult congenital, any role for that? Uh, please, please repeat your question. I was looking at my phone uh, from a text from a colleague. Uh, can you repeat the question again? Sure. Yeah. For uh, patients with failed Fontan congenital adult patients, is there any role for uh, HeartMate 3? For a failed Fontan, if when, usually when they fail, they, they have a univentricle and they don't have an RV. So there is a role for that. Uh, and uh, I, my experience with congenital cases is very limited. But yes, I came across failed Fontan, but they had uh, Berlin hearts. But same same thing. You can you can still uh, you can still treat them with uh, with an LVAD heart mate three if they can fill their uh, their left side. Basically, Fontan patients don't have an RV and they rely on passive filling of the lungs. If that filling is adequate, I don't see a reason why not. Yeah, their single ventricle can be supported with an LVAD. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Doctor. Yeah. Hello. Wait, right. if no more questions, we will conclude. Wait for another 10 seconds. Fisual. Hmm. Right. Thank you, Dr. Haytham, for your yeah. presentation. يا هلا والله يا هلا لؤي شكرا لكم جميعا واتمنى ان شاء الله ان يكون التوفيق حليفكم جميعا انتم الاخوه اللي داخلين الامتحان وكذلك غير الممتحنين واذا في اي سؤال رقمي موجود في اي استفسار ام افيلبل اني تايم يعطيك العافيه شكرا لك شكرا لكم على الحضور والمشاركه وبالتوفيق جميعا سو ويل هاف ا بريك فور 10 مينتس اند ويل ريزيوم
عبد الهادي دكتور عبد الهادي Assalamu alaikum, Lai. If he is uh, not ready or not present yet, I can start if you'd like. Madras, Metani Lai. Assalamu alaikum everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, I will share my screen so I can start. Should we start, uh, Dr. Lai? Amjad? أيوة صوتي واضح؟ Yes, you can start. Okay. Okay. السلام عليكم again. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I am Amjad Bernawi. I'm a resident in uh, Saud Bapten Cardiac Center in Eastern Province. Today I'm going to talk about the guidelines of uh, adult congenital heart disease, uh, the 2018 guidelines newly released in uh, 2019. So, my outline, uh, let me just make it bigger. My outline will be like the following. Uh, first of all, we're going to talk about the investigations according to the our guidelines. Uh, then we're going to go to, through the mental health, concomitant syndromes, and heart failure guidelines. Uh, then we're going to uh, talk about uh, each diseases in adult congenital, like specific lesions, ASD, VSDs, 
and then going to left-sided obstructive lesions, right-sided lesions, and uh, ending by the complex lesions. So uh, as a beginning for the investigations, uh, the ACG is, uh, is essential part for complete uh, cardiovascular evaluation of uh, adult congenital heart disease. So it is uh, stayed as uh, class, uh, uh, yeah, as uh, class one uh, level C uh, to do ECG for uh, patients with uh, congenital heart disease for classification or when symptoms developed or worsen. And it's uh, also class one level C to do ambulatory uh, echocardiography, AKG, for patients uh, with uh, arrhythmias, even if they are asymptomatic. Uh, this is for the AKG. For the echo, um, uh, a large retrospective study has shown that the routine use of uh, intraoperative uh, TTE has a substantial impact of patient's care, leading to alteration of uh, plant procedure uh, revision, initial repair in 14% uh, of cases. Having said that, so when the echo, as it says in the schedule here on the right side, it will be class one level B the, to do intraoperative TEE uh, recommended to guide the surgical repair. And uh, also for the TTE, for the trunk thoracic, it's class one for patients uh, uh, to do an assessment or serial assessment based on the anatomical or physiological severity. Uh, for the uh, going to the imaging for the cardiac MR, also what we can see here it's class one, level B for inpatients with the adult congenital uh, heart disease, have or uh, or who are at the risk to developing RV enlargement and dysfunction. So serial of cardiac MR is recommended for quantitative assessment of the RV sizes, especially. And that yes. Sorry for disturbing. I think there is an issue with the screen. We can see half of the screen, not the really? full screen. I don't know. Uh, it's for me. It's a full screen. Let me try if I get out, out of the full presentation. How about that? How how about now? No, we is can see still... this is the presenter mode. I don't know what the problem. So we can go with that. Is it clear or is it all the, is it yes, the, all the good. presentation? Okay, we can go that with that. Okay, so uh, it will be class 2A for the cardiac MR. So it can be useful as initial uh, evaluation and serial assessment of uh, specific patients based on the anatomical uh, complexity, uh, complexity and the clinical status. Uh, then for the, we, we have the cardiac uh, CT. The cardiac CT imaging, it's class 2A for patients with the adult congenital uh, to have an information that cannot be obtained by other diagnostic modalities. So it can be, um, important enough to justify the exposure of the ionizing radiation. Uh, moving to the uh, mental uh, health status um, assessment for patients with adult congenital, uh, I found it uh, important to uh, some uh, assessment for the mental health for the patients and the, their uh, families. So uh, it's a class one for patients with, uh, with uh, adult congenital heart disease to, should be evaluated for depression or anxiety. And the uh, class 2A for referral of mental health evaluation to treat the reasonable patient with the adult congenital as well. Because uh, as you know, Jan, it's, um, they, they are usually young and their families, just to let them know the, the sequence and the, the follow-up of their diseases. Uh, also, it's class 2B for uh, the neurodevelopment or neurophysiological testing, maybe to be considered in some patients uh, to guide the therapies and to enhance the academic behavior or psychosocial that, that, uh, that uh, the function of their nature of their disease. 
Uh, for the concomitant syndromes, uh, it's class 2A for the genetic testing, especially in the DiGeorge syndrome. Uh, it will be reasonable for patients, to, especially those with the conotruncal cardiac defects. Um, also for the non-cardiac uh, medical issues, it's a class one also for patients with adult congenital at risk to screen for hepatitis C. Uh, this is schedule, just uh, to sum up, I find it interesting to that the, the syndromes, each syndrome and with the clinical feature and the, the genetic anomaly. For example, DiGeorge, it will be in uh, most likely in the aortic arch anomalies, truncus arteriosus and tough patients, Down syndromes, as we know in uh, ASD, VSD patients, uh, Holt or uh, Ram syndrome for patients also with the ASD and VSD. Uh, also for the client filter syndrome, uh, patients with the BDA, ASD, and uh, MV prolapse. Uh, sorry, Abdul Malik, the problem is that if you look at the full presenting, it will be يعني, half as you said. Ah, OK, Yeah, let's try. So. Well, how about now? Can you see the whole slide? La, la. Yeah, yeah, this is, yeah, yeah, this is the problem. Sorry about that. So, uh, yeah, so uh, can, uh, you can see the schedule. Yeah, you can, I put it as a reference. Also for the client filter, as I mentioned, the syndrome, the PDAs, ASD, and uh, the, the MV prolapse. For non an syndrome also, the pulmonary stenosis, ASD, and uh, hypotrophic, hypotrophic cardiopathies, Turner syndrome, patients with correctations by uh, biventricular uh, aortic uh, valve, and uh, Williams syndrome, also the supra aortic stenosis, etc. So for patients with, with the heart failure, it's class one, uh, level C, to consult an adult congenital and the heart failure specialties uh, for patients with adult congenital heart disease for the severe ventricular dysfunction. Uh, so now coming to the patients with the ASD as a specific uh, anomalies. So for the ASD patients, uh, it's a class one uh, to put patients in pulse oximetry at rest and during exercise. It's highly recommended to evaluate the, the adult or unrepaired or repaired ASD with residual shunt. Also, it's class one to do uh, cardiac MR or CT. Uh, also, TEE, it's useful to evaluate the pulmonary venous uh, connections in adult with the ASD. Uh, also, again, class one that, that to do echo imaging, it's, to rec it's highly recommended to guide the percutaneous ASD closure as interoperative. Uh, having said that, it's uh, class one also, and uh, as a therapeutic and an adult with, uh, with isolated secundum ASD, causing impaired functional capacity to the right atrial or with the RV enlargement, uh, with the left to right shunts uh, to sufficiently large to cause uh, physiological uh, sequelae. For example, pulmonary systemic blood flow with the ratio of uh, more than one, uh, one, one and a half over one without cyanosis at rest uh, during exercise or uh, patients with the RV volume and improved exercise tolerance is recommended as well. Um, also, again, uh, the adults with the primum ASD, sinus venosis defect or coronary sinus defect causing impaired functional capacity, uh, right atrial and the RV enlargement and left to right shunts uh, sufficiently large to cause physiological sequelae of uh, QBQS uh, ratio of uh, more than or equal one and a half over one without cyanosis. Uh, it's class 2A 
for patients asymptomatic with isolated secondum ASD, right atrial and uh, RV enlargement with uh, left to right chant sufficient, sufficiently uh, large to cause uh, physiological uh, sequelae of uh, QP, QS ratio one and a half uh, over one or greater. Uh, again, class 2A uh, for surgical closure of secundum ASD in adults reasonable with concomitant surgical procedure uh, being informed and uh, there is a left to right shunt. Uh, class 2B for percutaneous or surgical closure may be considered with adult uh, with ASD with left to right shunt with QP, QS is uh, one and a half or one or greater uh, pulmonary artery systolic pressure uh, over 50%. And uh, class three, which is harm or contraindicated, uh, to do ASD closure should not be performed in adult with the P, uh, pulmonary artery systolic pressure greater than two thirds of systemic, uh, suprasystemic uh, uh, pressure to pulmonary vascular resistance. So, Having said that, the chart will uh, sum up uh, the, the, the guidelines. So if the patient with the second MASD uh, depends on the chance, is it left to right early or right to left, uh, as in Eisminger? So if the hemodynamics assessment, uh, the patient with pulmonary vascular resistance uh, less than one over three systemic vascular resistance and the pulmonary uh, arter uh, arterial uh, systolic pressure less than 50%, uh, the, the right heart enlargement and the shunt large enough to cause uh, physiological sequelae with the QPQS ratio more than a, one and a half or over one. So it will be, uh, depends on the functional impairment. If there is functional impairment, the surgical or device closure is class one indicated. If no, uh, the surgical or uh, device closure will be as a class two A. Uh, if the pulmonary vascular resistance more than one and uh, over three systemic vascular resistance with the pulmonary uh, arterial systolic pressure more than 50% systemic. So the consultation with the adult congenital and uh, expertise will be uh, for surgical device or uh, for surgical or device closure as a class 2B. Uh, for that, uh, this is for the left to right shunt. For the right to left shunt, uh, if the patient confirm a pulmonary hypertension diagnosis, uh, often requiring invasive hemodynamics assessment, this is class one, without going to any further uh, management. If there is also, so you have to put him in medical uh, management, like to, to give him uh, bones and tan as a class one or to give him uh, prostaglandin inhibitors as a class two or combination therapy as a class two A, but uh, no closure at all. This is contraindicated. This is the, the bottom line. <clears throat> For the anomalous of pulmonary venous uh, connection, it's a class one uh, to do cardiac MR or uh, CT, CTA is recommended for evaluation of partial anomalous of pulmonary venous connection. Uh, also, uh, to class 2A uh, for, uh, to do cardiac cath, uh, it can be useful for adult uh, congenital as uh, the partial anomalous uh, uh, will be further defined that the hemodynamics of the patients. Uh, also, uh, as a therapeutic, uh, it will be class one for uh, surgical repair. It's recommended in patients with uh, partial anomalous uh, pulmonary venous connection when the functional capacity is um, impaired and RV enlargement is present. Uh, class one will be uh, repair of uh, partial anomalous pulmonary venous connection is recommended at the time of closure. Uh, especially in uh, sinus venosis defect or ASD. Uh, uh, class one uh, level B will be for a repair of scimitar vein is recommended in adults when functional capacity is impaired, especially with evidence of RB volume overload uh, or there is a left to right chunk sufficiently with the ratio larger than one and a half over one. 
and pulmonary uh, systolic pressure is less than 50 percent uh, class 2a level p will be surgery can be useful for right to left uh, sided partial anomalous pulmonary venous connection uh, with patients even uh, asymptomatic with uh, rv volume overloaded uh, or net left to right chunk sufficient sufficiently with the ratio more than one and a half over one or the pulmonary pressure less than 50 percent and class 2a uh, level p for surgery can be uh, useful for repair of scimitar vein in adults with evidence of rv volume overload with the qbqs ratio one and a half over one or greater uh, for the VSDs, I'm going uh, through the, the algorithm directly. It's, uh, it will be more clear and sum up that, that, that schedule. So for the hemodynamics, significant uh, VSD uh, depends again in the shunt direction. If it's left to right early or right to left, uh, uh, for example, as in Eisminger. So if the hemodynamics assessment uh, the LV enlargement, the QBQS ratio, more than or equal, one and a half over one. Uh, the pulmonary artery systolic pressure, less than 50% systemic. And the pulmonary vascular resistance, less than one over three systemic. Uh, if yes, if this is uh, found to be, uh, the surgical or device closure will be class one. If no, uh, the progressive... Uh, AR due to the, uh, the, uh, the pre-membranous uh, or the surgical VSD uh, depends on if it's present, the surgical or device closure, again, it will be class 2A. If no, uh, it will be, you will revise the history of infective endocarditis. If there is history of infective carditis, surgical or device closure also will be class 2B uh, as indication. If no, so you will continue follow-up. This is uh, one thing. The other, if, if there is a pulmonary vascular resistance, more than uh, one over three systemic uh, and or pulmonary artery systolic pressure, more than 50% systemic, so you will consult the adult congenital immediately. This is class one. Uh, if it's uh, proved to be, so surgical uh, or device closure will be class 2B, according to, the, to their uh, opinion. Uh, in the right left chance, uh, first of all, again, you will confirm the pulmonary hypertension diagnosis, uh, which is uh, required the invasive hemodynamics uh, assessment. This is class 1. If yes, um, again, the same medical therapy you will go through on as in uh, ASD. Uh, so for the, 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 the AVSD, for the atrial ventricular uh, septal defect, will be uh, as a class 2A of, in the diagnosis to do cardiac cath. It can be useful. It may or may not uh, you, uh, you need to, to do for the adult congenital to die, uh, to check for the pulmonary hypertension if it's suspected. But as a therapeutic, it will be class one level C to do surgery for the severe left uh, AVSD, uh, especially with the atrioventricular valve uh, regurgitation. Um, also it's class one level C to do surgery as a primary repair for the AVSD or closure of the residual shunt uh, in the adults if repaired of the atrioventricular septal defect is recommended, especially when the ratio is uh, the QPQS is more than one over one and a half over one, or the pulmonary artery systolic pressure less than 50. Uh, it says class 2A uh, level C, the operation for the, the, the direct LVOT postruction. An adult with uh, atrioventricular septal defect is reasonable for the maximum gradient of 50 or lesser gradient in, uh, if the patient's in heart failure uh, symptoms. Um, also, what's uh, recommended uh, as a class 2B level C, uh, the surgery for primary repair with the AVSD closure 
of residual shunt in adults with the repair uh, atrioventricular septal defect may consider in uh, presence of uh, left right shunt with the ratio of uh, one and a half over one or pulmonary pressure uh, in 50% or more. And it's harm or contraindicated uh, for surgery to be repaired, the uh, AVSD uh, or residual shunt with the patient uh, with the pulmonary systolic pressure greater than two thirds of the systemic system, suprasystemic. Uh, this is for the AVSD. For the patent ductus arteriosus, uh, as a diagnostic, as a class one level C, to do the measurements of the oxygen saturation. So we can know that, that the patients, if, it, uh, uh, if it's performed in the feet or both hands and uh, in the adults uh, for the BDA to assist the presence of uh, the right to left chunk. And it's class 2A level C to, in addition to standard diagnosis tool uh, like CATH to, to CATH the patient. So it, can, it may can be useful to suspect pulmonary hypertension. Uh, for the therapeutic wise, uh, class one level C, the, the BTA closure in adults, it's recommended in the left atrial or LV enlargement if it's pre uh, present, uh, with, along with the BDA with the left to right shunt, with the PA systolic pressure less than 50%. Uh, it's class 2B, uh, level B uh, for B. DA closure in adults may be considered in presence of uh, left to right shunt if PA systolic pressure is greater than 50%. And again, it's harmful to do BDA closure for suprasystemic patients, suprasystemic pulmonary hyper uh, pulmonary pressure. Um, we're going to shift gears to the left sided obstructive lesions. Uh, for the left side obstructive lesions, uh, the first of all the core titriatum. Uh, it's as a diagnostic, it's class one level B for adult presenting with the core titriatum. Uh, since sister should be evaluated uh, with the, for the congenital abnormalities, particularly those with the A uh, ASD or VSD or anomalous in the pulmonary uh, venous connection as well. And it's class 2A level B to a uh, level B uh, in, a, in adults with the prior repair of the triatum uh, and recurrent symptoms, it's reasonable to evaluate the pulmonary pain stenosis. And for therapeutic wise, it's class one level B to do surgical repair. It's indicated when the core triatum uh, for symptoms uh, attributed to the obstruction of the substantial gradient across the membrane. Uh, for the congenital uh, aortic valve stenosis, it's uh, class one uh, as a diagnostic to do uh, for patients with the bicuspid aortic valve should be evaluated for cor uh, correctation of the aorta by clinical examination or by imaging studies. Uh, and it's class 2A, level B, to, for reasonable uh, screen uh, for the, uh, first degree, uh, to, to screen the first degree relatives for the patients for bypass with aortic valve. Uh, having said that, uh, for the therapeutic wise, uh, it's class 2B, level B, in adults with bypass with aortic valve stenosis and non calcified valve with no more than uh, mild AR meeting the indication for the intervention uh, by, uh, by a heart team meeting or multidisciplinary team, it may be reasonable to treat with the balloon valvoplasty. Uh, for the congenital mitral stenosis, uh, it's class one level B for adult congenital mitral stenosis or uh, parachute mitral valve should be evaluated other left side obstructive lesions as well. <clears throat> For the supraortic stenosis, diagnostic wise, it's class 2B level C to do stress uh, testing and, and adults with LVOT obstructing to determine the exercise capacity and to introduce the symptoms and then echo and to see the changes or the, if there is arrhythmias, which may be reasonable to uh, do uh, to for the presence or otherwise uh, equivocal indication for the intervention. Um, 
for the therapeutic wise, uh, it's class one level C, surgical intervention is recommended for adults with uh, subaortic stenosis with the gradient of 50 or more than symptom uh, or symptoms uh, more attributed with the aortic stenosis or subaortic stenosis. Uh, also, it's class one level C for surgical intervention is recommended in uh, adults with uh, subaortic stenosis with uh, less than uh, 50 uh, mil uh, millimeter uh, gradient, uh, maximum gradient uh, and uh, heart failure or ischemic symptoms. And LP systolic dysfunction attributed to the subaortic stenosis. Uh, class 2B level C will be to prevent the prognosis of uh, aortic gauge. Surgical intervention may be considered for asymptomatic adults, at least with the gradient of uh, 50 or greater than 50. Uh, going next to um, Turner syndrome in uh, left-sided patients. Uh, it will be uh, class one level B, especially for women with the Turner syndrome to be evaluated for bicuspid aorta uh, to, for, uh, to evaluate also the correctation of the aorta and enlargement of the ascending aorta as well, as it will affect that the management plan. Uh, therapeutic wise, it, class two A level B, a prophylactic replacement of the aortic root or ascending aorta in adults with the Turner syndrome. It's reasonable with the aortic diameter of two and a half uh, or greater. Uh, for the correctation of the aorta, uh, the initial follow up of aortic imaging using cardiac MR or uh, CTA is recommended in adults with the correctation of aorta, including those who have surgical or catheter intervention. This is class 1B. And for the resting, blood pressure should be measured in upper or lower extrem extremities in all adults with the correctation of aorta as a diagnosis. This is class one level C. Uh, for, the, uh, for the diagnosis also, it's uh, to do uh, ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. For the adults with correctation aorta, it's class 2A level C. To do screening for the intracranial aneurysm by uh, MRA or uh, CT may be reasonable in patients with correctation of aorta. This is class 2B. And exercise testing to evaluate the exercise, including hypertension, may be reasonable in adults with the correctation of aorta. Uh, this is class 2B, uh, class 2B uh, level C. Uh, therapeutic wise, uh, it will be class one level B to do surgical repair or catheter-based stenting uh, for adult uh, with the hypertension or significant native uh, recurrent correctation of aorta. Uh, also class one level C uh, to do uh, a heart meeting is recommended to treatment of hypertension in patient with the correctation of uh, the aorta. Class 2B, level B, will be for balloon angioplasty for adults with the native and uh, recurrent correctation of aorta may be considered if the stent placement is not feasible and surgical intervention is not option as well. Uh, for the supravalvular aortic stenosis, uh, aortic imaging like TTE, TEE, or uh, a cardiac MR or CT is recommended for adults, especially the, those with Williams syndrome or patients who are suspected to have supraaortic stenosis. This is class one level C. Uh, coronary imaging is recommended in patients with Williams syndrome and supraaortic stenosis, those who are presenting with symptoms of coronary ischemia as well. This is class one level C. Uh, for the therapeutic wise, uh, Surgical repair is recommended for adults with the supravalvular aortic stenosis or uh, patients with the symptoms with decreased LV systolic function uh, deemed to secondary aortic obstruction. This is class one level B. Uh, for the coronary artery revascularization, revascularization is recommended in symptomatic adults with supraaortic stenosis and coronary osteal stenosis. 
this is definitely class one level C. Uh, coming to the right-sided uh, heart lesion, uh, the right-sided lesion um, for the pulmonary stenosis uh, will be uh, in adults who are uh, moderate or severe uh, valvular pulmonary stenosis. Uh, otherwise, unexplained symptoms of uh, heart failure, cyanosis, or uh, intraarterial uh, right to left uh, communication uh, by exercise intolerance or pal balloon valvoplasty is recommended. Uh, this is class one level B. Uh, in adults with moderate or severe valvular, uh, valvular pulmonary stenosis, Otherwise, also unexplained uh, symptoms of heart failure, cyanosis, or exercise intolerance are ineligible for uh, failed uh, balloon valve plasty. Surgical, is, uh, surgical repair is recommended. This is class one level B. For those with asymptomatic uh, severe pulmonary stenosis, intervention is reasonable. Uh, this is class 2A. Uh, for uh, pulmonary regage after repair of pulmonary stenosis, uh, in symptomatic patient with the moderate or greater than uh, pulmonary regage resting for treat isolated pulmonary stenosis with RV dilatation or RV dysfunction, pulmonary valve replacement is recommended. Um, this is uh, class one level C. Uh, for asymptomatic patient with the residual uh, PR uh, resulting in uh, treatment of isolated pulmonary stenosis with the uh, dilated right ventricle. This is uh, with a serial follow-up uh, also is recommended. But for those with asymptomatic patients with moderate or greater than uh, PR resulting from treatment of uh, isolated pulmonary stenosis uh, with progression of RV dilatation, RV dysfunction, pulmonary valve replacement may be reasonable. So it's class 2B uh, level C. And we can see again uh, the algorithm. Uh, it's uh, sum up uh, and put a roadmap for the guidelines. So the assessment for the patients with the PR severity and RV uh, uh, size or function, uh, you will see if it's mild and uh, RV enlargement, uh, interval follow-up, it's uh, class 2A. Uh, it's class one, sorry, indicated. Uh, or if it's moderate or greater with RV enlargement, uh, you will see if the, if the patient's symptomatic, it's class A to do uh, replacement. If no imaging and uh, you will do TTE, uh, you will do uh, cardiac MR, you will do some imaging to assess. If the progressive RV dilatation and RV dysfunction or progressive decrease in exercise capacity, pulmonary valve replacement you may consider. If no, uh, interval follow-up with adult uh, congenital cardiologist is recommended. And here we can see the decrease of the RVOT obstruction. Uh, mild, it will be the peak gradient less than 36. Uh, moderate, the peak gradient 36 to 64. Uh, and the peak velocity three to four. Uh, milliseconds and the severe will be the peak gradient more than uh, 64. Uh, coming to the branch and the peripheral pulmonary stenosis, uh, it would be class one uh, level B for adults with the peripheral branch pulmonary stenosis and going to surveillance in, is recommended. Uh, in adults with the peripheral branch pulmonary, uh, pulmonary stenosis with uh, dilatation and stenting, it can be useful. Uh, for epistine anomaly, uh, diagnostic-wise, uh, in adults with epistine anomaly, uh, cardiac uh, MR uh, can be useful to, to determine the anatomy of the RV dimensions and the systolic function. So it's class 2A, uh, level B. For the adults with the epistine anomaly, uh, TE can be useful in surgical planning. Or if, that, if TE imaging uh, inadequate uh, to evaluate the tricuspid valve morphology and function, uh, the, is, uh, the uh, AKG or uh, with the catheter ablation are, can be useful in 
diagnostic evaluation of the adults with the cystine anomaly and ventricular uh, pre-excitation, but without uh, supraventricular tachycardia. This is class 2A level B. In adults with the Pistine anomaly, AKG study uh, with catheter ablation if needed is reasonable before the surgical intervention uh, on the tricuspid valve, even the absence of uh, pre-excitation or supraventricular tachycardia. Uh, Therapeutic-wise, uh, surgical repair uh, or reoperation of adults with the Pistine anomaly is significant and recommended uh, for one or more uh, of the following patients who are having heart failure symptoms or objective evidence of worsening uh, with exercise, uh, progressive RV systolic dysfunction, especially by uh, echo or by uh, cardiac MR. Uh, also for the, the catheter ablation is recommended in adults with Epstein anomaly is a high risk pathway conduction or multiple accessory pathway. This is the class one level C. Uh, surgical repair or reoperation of patients with epstein anomaly uh, with significant TR is beneficial in presence of progressive RV enlargement, systemic uh, desaturation de uh, de from right to left, uh, atrial shunt or barodexical embolism, and atrial tachyarrhythmia. This is class 2A level B. Uh, bidirectional uh, superior uh, cavo pulmonary, pulmonary uh, anastomosis, uh, Glenn, uh, at time of epistine anomaly repair may be considered for adults when severe RV dilatation or severe uh, RV systolic dysfunction is present. Um, double chambered right ventricle, um, it's a type of uh, congenital anomalies that is. Uh, the, the kind of repair with the double chamber uh, ventricle or moderate uh, or greater than uh, outflow obstruction is recommended in patients with the otherwise unexplained symptoms of heart failure, cyanosis, or exercise limitation. This is class one, level C. Uh, also, surgical repair in adults with the double chamber right ventricle with the severe gradient may be considered in asymptomatic patient. Uh, okay, coming to the tough patients. So uh, the tough uh, patients for the repair with the pulmonary regurg for patients with the tough uh, severely decreased LV or RV systolic function, if yes, so evaluation by adult congenital uh, cardiologist and advance of heart failure will be as a class one. If no uh, LV or RV systolic function, so you will look up at the pulmonary valve severity. If it's mild PR, so follow up with the adult congenital cardiologist uh, as well, class one. If it's moderate or severe, you will look up at the symptoms. If it's, uh, the patient is symptomatic, pulmonary valve replacement is class one. If no, you will see uh, any of two of the, the following, mild or moderate RV or systolic dysfunction with the severe RV dilatation, or uh, secondly, severe RV dilatation uh, as in RVDV uh, more than 160 milliliter per uh, meter square or uh, the right ventricular uh, in systolic uh, pressure of more than 80 or the RVEDV more than uh, two times of the LV uh, of the left ventricular endostolic uh, pressure. Uh, also, you're gonna look at the right ventricular uh, systolic pressure uh, if it's due to the RVOT obstruction, uh, more than two over three systemic pressure, or progressive uh, reduction in uh, objective exercise tolerance. This is the, the quantification of uh, numbers yani, to, to, look up, uh, to look at them. Uh, if yes, again, uh, you will do pulmonary valve replacement as the class 2A. If no, uh, you will uh, look at the rhythm and uh, the ECG. If the patients have any kind of tachyarrhythmia, again, uh, pulmonary uh, valve replacement is uh, indicated as you may, you may uh, uh, do 
If no, uh, you will look up the residual lesions uh, requiring surgical intervention. If there is any residual lesion, you may consider that the replacement. If no, we'll follow up with the adult congenital. It's uh, class one. For the right to uh, ventricle uh, to be a conduit, uh, it's a class one uh, level B for coronary artery comparison testing with the simultaneous uh, coronary angiography uh, in high pressure balloon dilatation as a conduit for uh, before the right ventricle to PA. Uh, also, it's class one level B in patient with the stinted right ventricle to PA conduit especially those with worsening uh, pulmonary stenosis or pulmonary regurg, evaluation to the conduit uh, complication should be performed, including the fluoroscopy to evaluate the stent, uh, to, to see the fracture and the blood cultural to, to assist for infective endocarditis. And you may consider uh, that uh, in an adult with the right ventricle to PA conduit, uh, if they have uh, any kind of an arrhythmia, congestive heart failure with uh, unexplained ventricular dis dysfunction or uh, cyanotic uh, cath, um, maybe it's uh, reasonable to do. Uh, therapeutic wise, right ventricle to uh, PA conduit intervention is reasonable in adults with right ventricle to PA conduit uh, and moderate or greater than PR. Uh, PR or moderate or greater stenosis, as seen in the table. Uh, right ventricle to PA conduit intervention may be reasonable to asymptomatic adults, and the, the right ventricle to PA conduit with the severe stenosis, the severe regurg with the reduced RV injection fraction to RV dilatation. This is class 2B, level B. Okay, going to the complex lesions, uh, which is the final, uh, the last outlines on my presentation. Uh, the TGA with the arterial switch, uh, the TGA with the, the, the trans, uh, the uh, trans greater, uh, the, uh, the TGA with the arterial switch uh, is uh, uh, ambulatory monitoring for, as a uh, diagnosis for patients with uh, bradycardia or uh, sinus uh, node dysfunction is recommended for adults with the uh, TGA and uh, arterial switch, especially those with the uh, treated with beta blocker or other slowing agent. This is the class one uh, level C. Uh, or uh, patient, adults with the uh, TGA with arterial switch repair should be undergo with annular imaging either uh, echo or uh, MRI uh, or MR, sorry, uh, to evaluate for the common long-term complications of the arterial switch. This is the class one also. Uh, for the assessment of the communication through the intra-arterial uh, buffle or the venous stenosis is reasonable in adult with the TGA uh, along with the arterial switch. It's particularly a uh, transvenous pacemaker or ICD implantation is considered. Uh, this is class 2A level C. Um, heart team meeting to have appropriate intention for the needs of uh, anticoagulation is recommended promptly for the, to restore the rhythm in adult with the patient with the TGA with the arterial switch. This is class A uh, level B. Uh, for, uh, for patients, uh, again, with uh, TGA with arterial switch, uh, to, it's a baseline or serial imaging with either echo, cardiac MR, should be performed in adults with the uh, TGA and arterial switch, uh, new aortic dilatation, valve dysfunction, uh, pulmon uh, pulmonary uh, artery or a branch pulmonary artery stenosis or ventricular dysfunction. Uh, this is class uh, one level C. Uh, coronary vascularization for those patients uh, as planned by surgeon for interventional cardiologist for revascularization or collaboration with the adult congenital uh, 
heart disease uh, physician. It's to provide or ensure the coronary and pulmonary artery anatomy to be understood. This is the class one level C. Uh, also, it's reasonable uh, to perform the anatomic evaluation of the coronary artery patency uh, by angio or CT or MR, whatever. Uh, especially uh, even in an uh, asymptomatic patient. Uh, also, the physiological test uh, of myocardial perfusion of adults uh, with the TGI with arterial switch can be beneficial to assess the symptoms suggestive of myocardial ischemia. Uh, this is class uh, 2A level B. Uh, physiological test of myocardial uh, 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 sorry, uh, the, the, uh, the, it's reasonable to determine the need of coronary vascularization for adult with TGA and arterial switch. This is class 2A level uh, C. Uh, it's uh, therapeutic wise uh, to do meeting, uh, to, to do hearty meeting is reasonable to determine the indications for aortic valve replacement in adult with the TGA after arterial switch with the severe new aortic valve regurgitation. This is class two, uh, two A level C. Catheter or intervention or surgical intervention for the pulmonary stenosis is reasonable in adults, uh, especially in those patients, uh, especially those who have symptoms of heart failure or decreased exercise capacity. Uh, it's class two A level C. Uh, the congenital corrected transposition of great artery uh, to diagnose those patients uh, with the cardiac MR reasonable in adult to determine the systemic RV dimensions and systolic function. This is class 2A level C. Uh, therapeutic wise, uh, to do tricuspid valve replacement is recommended for symptomatic patients and uh, severe TR or uh, preserved mildly uh, decreased systemic ventricular function also is class one level B. Uh, for the tricuspid valve replacement, it's reasonable for asymptomatic patients uh, with the severe TR with the dilatation or mild dysfunction of the systemic ventricle. This is class two A level C. And the conduit of the intervention or replacement may be considered in patients with the corrected transposition of great vessels uh, to symptomatic subpulmonary uh, left ventricle to be a conduit dysfunction. It will be recognized that uh, the, under, uh, the unloading uh, subpulmonary ventricle may have detrimental impact in systemic uh, atrioventricular valve function as well. So it's class 2B, level B. Uh, for the Fontan palliation of single uh, ventricle, it's class 1, level C uh, for patients who have new presentation of atrial uh, tachyarrhythmia or, uh, and include the prevention of thromboembolic event and uh, con consultation with the electrophysiologist uh, with the congenital heart disease expertise is highly recommended. Uh, uh, diagnostic wise, also uh, adults after Fontan palliation should be evaluated for annually with the uh, echo or cardiac MR. Um, it's class one, level C. Uh, for uh, uh, cardiac catheterization, uh, should be performed in adults before the initial Fontan surgery or even uh, for revision of prior Fontan connection to assess the suitability for the. Pre pre-intervention hemodynamics for the Fontan physiology and to get a better understanding. This is class one level C. Uh, the new onset or the worsening of the atrial tachyarrhythmia in adults with a single ventricle and Fontan palliation should be prompt uh, to search the pot potential hemodynamics abnormality. This is class one level C. Uh, adults with the uh, Fontan palliation, it's reasonable to encourage regular exercise program appropriate to their abilities. Uh, you, you may consider that as a class 2A. Uh, also imaging uh, for the, uh, by uh, imaging for the liver uh, by, ultra, uh, by ultrasound or by cardiac MR or CT with, along with the laboratory evaluation. 
uh, to shake up for the function of the uh, liver fibrosis or cirrhosis with hepatocellular carcinoma are reasonable in adults after frontal palliation. Um, in, in adults with the frontal palliation, it's uh, reasonable to perform the biochemical and uh, uh, hematological testing in annular basis, especially in patients with liver and renal function. Um, it's a class 2A. Uh, cardiac catheterization can be useful to evaluate the symptomatic adult after frontal palliation with non-invasive uh, testing, um, which is insufficient to, the, to guide the therapy. This is class 2A. Uh, evaluation with the cardiac transplantation reasonable for adults with the frontal palliation and signs of sim or symptoms of uh, protein losing enteropathy. This is class 2A. Um, having said that, also uh, it will be it may be reasonable to perform the catheterization or in asymptomatic patients with the frontal palliation. Uh, therapeutic wise, uh, anticoagulation with vitamin K antagonist is uh, like warfarin is recommended with the adults with frontal palliation with known or suspected thrombus, thromboembolic event or prior uh, uh, arrhythmia and contraindicated uh, to anticoagulation. This is the class one level C. Uh, catheter ablation can be useful in adults with frontal palliation with the uh, intra-arterial uh, uh, re-entrant uh, re of tachycardia or focal atrial uh, tachycardia. This is class 2A. Uh, uh, also the frontal revision surgery, including arrhythmia surgery indicated is reasonable for adults with arteriopulmonary fontan connection with recurrent uh, atrial tachyarrhythmia refra refractory to the pharmacological therapy and catheter ablation who have uh, preserved systolic ventricle function. This is class 2A, level C. Uh, pulmonary vasoactive medication can be beneficial to improve the exercise capacity in adults with fontan repair. This is class 2A, level B. Uh, Antiplatelet therapy or uh, anticoagulation with uh, vitamin K agonist may be considered in adults with frontal palliation. This is class 2B, level B. Um, also, the reoperation of the uh, intervention with the structural or anatomical abnormalities with frontal palliated patient with symptoms with the failure of frontal circulation may be considered. Uh, for patients, uh, finally, for patients with uh, severe pulmonary hypertension, uh, diagnostic-wise, it's class one level B to uh, to do uh, to see if there is uh, that the pulmonary resistance is two and a half uh, woods unit or greater uh, should be assessed uh, by uh, uh, adult congenital heart disease cardiologist uh, and expertise to. To, to, to develop management plan. And uh, also with, for adults with the septal or uh, greater artery shunts should be undergo for periodic screening for uh, pulmonary hypertension with the TTE. This is class one level B. Uh, cardiac catheterization to assist the pulmonary vascular re resistance in hemodynamics, it's class one level B for those patients. <clears throat> In adults with the septal greater artery shunts, cardiac cath with the hemodynamics, also it's class one level B. Uh, for uh, to do BNB, uh, chest X-ray, uh, six minute walk test and uh, cardiac cath, it's useful as initial, uh, uh, especially for the follow-up evaluation of patients with uh, adult congenital, uh, those who having pulmonary hypertension, it's class one level C. Uh, for Eisminger syndrome, uh, it's class one level C uh, to evaluate uh, those patients to confirm the diagnosis by imaging, by CAT, to see the accuracy and to exclude the potential of their uh, diseases, especially if it's right to left shunt uh, with the pulmonary hypertension. Uh, therapeutic wise, uh, to do, uh, to, to give Bozentan, uh, it's beneficial in asymptomatic uh, adult with uh, Eisminger syndrome with uh, ASD or VSD. It's class one, level A. It's a strong one. 
uh, it's uh, symptomatic uh, if the, the adult are symptomatic with the Eisminger syndrome, Bosentan and uh, prostaglandin inhibitors are reasonable uh, in combination in asymptomatic to, to sim if symptomatic, sorry, improvement does not occur with uh, either medication alone. It's class two level, uh, class two A level B. Uh, Posentan has, uh, is a uh, reasonable therapy to treat the symptomatic adult with Eisminger syndrome with one of the following, uh, whether uh, those who have shunts with ASD or BSD, uh, or uh, those with the complex congenital heart lesions, uh, like those who have uh, Down syndrome. This is level uh, 2A level, uh, uh, it's class 2A level C or level B. Uh, it's class 2A, uh, level B, uh, to, it's to, to reasonable to use uh, prostaglandin inhibitors for, uh, or for example, sildenafil or taldafil to treat the symptomatic adults with Eisminger syndrome, uh, especially those who have ASD or VSD uh, or the greater artery shunt. Um, this is uh, this schedule uh, for the factors that may relate to the clinical importance uh, for those patients who are uh, at risk of uh, sudden cardiac death, um, the age, the anatomy of the coronary osteum and the proximal coronary uh, course, the anomalous uh, origin, the exercise, ischemia, and uh, the symptoms as well. Uh, speaking of the anomalous, so the anomalous aortic origin of the coronary artery, uh, the algorithm says if it's left coronary from the right sinus, uh, ischemic symptoms or ischemia during diagnosis testing, it's class one to do intervention. Uh, if there is no ischemia, so it's class two A for surgical intervention. If right coronary from the left sinus, uh, ischemic symptoms or ischemic uh, during the, the diagnosis testing? If yes, it's class one to do surgical intervention. If no, you will see the ventricular arrhythmia. If there is ventricular arrhythmia, it's class 2A to do surgical intervention. If no, cervical, uh, surgical intervention, uh, it's class 2B. Or uh, to do observation, also it's class 2B. Uh, and uh, that's pretty much about my presentation. Thank you. Uh, please let me know if there is any question. Okay, Thank you. Any question or comment for Amjad? So by this lecture, we concluded our academic activity for this year. There would be some changes in the schedule of our activity for the next academic year and maybe we'll announce it early next week inshallah so next week will be the Saudi heart so most likely there will be no academic activity if anyone if the resident have any suggestion or any critique for our academic activity for the last year he's more will, than welcome to give us his opinion either here or by contacting me, contact me directly and also if anyone is interested in participating in our team in arranging for the activity also he's most than welcome